Okay, welcome everyone. It uh, is indeed a, a great treat uh, for United Orthodox Synagogues uh, to welcome uh, one of the uh, great rabbinic leaders uh, in Israel, Rav Yuval Sherlow. I'll share Rav Sherlow's uh, bio uh, with you. Uh, I shared it uh, in the email. Um, Rav Sherlow is the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Amit Orot Shaul in Israel. He is a graduate of Yeshivat Hezder Haratzion, uh, ordained by the Chief Rabbi of Israel and a retired major in the Israeli Defense Force. He is a founding member of the rabbinic organization Sohar, which does many, many things, uh, but became most well known early on for trying to fix the uh, system of how rabbis do weddings in Israel in terms of uh, payment, in terms of showing up on time, in terms of all sorts of, of challenges that existed. And Sohar has done amazing, amazing things, uh, created a real Kiddush Hashem uh, in, that, in that realm. Uh, more specifically for the purposes of this, of this call, Rav Sherlow is a member of various Israeli governmental ethical committees of the Ministry of Health, including the Supreme Committee of the State of Israel, which approves treatments in genetic engineering and cell therapy, as well as the committee which allocates a budget for new drugs. Uh, in Israel, the way the healthcare system works is, uh, depending on whether or not the government accepts a drug as part of the normal treatment, then it's included. Otherwise, it's not included. And those are some of the included in your health care package. And those are some of the decisions, difficult decisions that need to be made by, uh, by doctors and med medical ethicists uh, in Israel. Uh, so Rav Sherlow is uh, uniquely positioned to speak to us about uh, the ethical and uh, public policy and halachic issues surrounding the uh, coronavirus uh, vaccine. When I was beginning to do the research uh, for, this, uh, for this conversation, um, I, I found an article which was written by uh, Rav Sherlow addressing and touching on some of the issues uh, reg regarding the, regarding the uh, vaccination and, uh, and some of my questions are going to are going to derive from uh, from that article, and some of them are just uh, general general questions. So, uh, Rav Sherlow, again, I welcome you, and uh, we welcome you to United Orthodox Synagogues virtually. It's wonderful to have you. It's a great, indeed, a great, great honor uh, to uh, to have you, uh, and we thank you. We thank you for joining us. So, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, I think we'll start again. So every, for everyone, for a few people who came on late, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I will get to them towards the end, uh, of our time together. We'll take about an hour, uh, to, uh, to speak with each other. Okay. So, uh, Rav Sherlow, thank you again. So by way of introduction, can you share with us, uh, in general terms, the ethical dilemmas as you see them? regarding uh, this, uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccination? Uh, I'll start also with uh, apologizing about my English and trying to describe how excited I am on this uh, occasion. For me, uh, every connection that we have between Israel and the jury all over the world really emphasize the, part, the fact that we are unified, that we are sharing the same tradition and many times the same dilemmas. And it's a really an excited uh, event. And thank you for having me and suffering, as I said, from my uh, lousy English. <clears throat> the uh, dilemmas, the ethical dilemmas about uh, this vaccine is a very, very long, uh, uh, wide range from the beginning. I'll give only examples about the ethical dilemmas. Some of them are also halachic dilemmas. From the beginning, the question from the ethical point of view, I'm not talking about the commercial, about the financing, but should it be developed and, and 
of the research? Should it be done by governmental in institutes or private companies? There's a lot of uh, ethical uh, consequences uh, about this question, who should be and who should uh, take the role and who should conduct it and, and, and make all the experiments. Uh, what shortcuts are the right things to do when you are in a pandemic such as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? And uh, there is a process and this process is actually was built out of a lot of experience and a lot of crisis that the human being world paid because of trying to make all kinds of shortcuts. So therefore, uh, we should go, you know, according to the book with all the details. But, but from the other hand, it's a, an emergency time. So what is <clears throat> ethical and what shortcuts when you try to balance between the risk and the profits and, 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 and uh, are you permitted to make all kinds of, uh, to make it quicker? From, I'm saying again, from the ethical point of view, there are many other aspects. Uh, another question is the people that are willing to take part as in the experiments. And that's actually something that I'm, that's my, was my job, job in Israel for many, many years. I was part of the, another governmental um, a committee that approves every experiment on human bodies in Israel. And uh, it is a question, even if it's freedom of choice and someone is willing to take all the risk and be infected by the virus and then check if this uh, vaccine is okay, should we as a society or as uh, ethical ex uh, experts interrupt and say, no, there are things you're not, you can't do according to ethical rules because the first thing in uh, bioethics, the first line is don't cause any damage, don't make anything wrong. And you're taking someone that is healthy and actually making them and, and risking him. What kind of informed consent can someone sign? And et cetera, et cetera. But now when the uh, vaccines are, uh, you know, are in the market. So the dilemmas are who should get them first because still we are limit, we have limits numbers of, of this vaccine in every society. So who should get them first? Uh, first of all, the staff in the hospitals and what is the position of teachers, for instance, soldiers, policemen, uh, or uh, elderly people in, in nursery houses and, uh, and in Israel, there's a big, big conversation. I also wrote about it because the government asked um, all kinds of uh, celebrities to advertise and to try to encourage people or to, to um, pursue the people in order to, to come and get this vaccine. But actually they got first in line before Halakha survivors. Uh, they got the vaccine. So this is one uh, uh, big uh, question. The second big dilemma and conversation in Israel is what to do with the people that refuse to take this vaccine. Uh, are you permitted as the you know, all kinds of sanctions or at least all kinds of uh, prevent, you know, the majority wants to prevent itself from the results that can come out from the people that are not uh, are not willing or afraid or whatever from the vaccine. And in the bottom line, and, and now it's starting, it will take time. What is our responsibility to poor uh, nations that don't, can't buy this vaccine? For instance, in Israel, and I was part of the, you know, starting this conversation about should Israel keep uh, vaccines more than they, we need it in, you know, you never know. So let's have uh, all kinds of reserves or it's not moral to uh, keep these vaccines as a reserve when there are nations that need it for, for the first shot. So these are the actually part of the dilemmas. I can give another big list, but uh, this is ethics. Ethics is asking not only what can we do, 
but also what should we do or what is the right thing to do? And from this aspect, it's like halacha. And halacha also asks not only what can we do, but what is the right thing to do in those uh, uh, occasions? So, so thank you. That's um, a very um, comprehensive answer. I'm going to try, want to come double back to some of those things. Uh, it's what you mentioned about the celebrities is very interesting. You know, here in the states, we have a, a dilemma developing, which is there seems to be within the African American community uh, a lack of trust of the government. This is based on historical realities and things that have happened to that community. Uh, and so there's discussion. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was an article in the, uh, a, a long uh, opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal suggesting that um, athletes be asked to do the same thing that the celebrities are doing in Israel. And it came up as well that uh, that's going to look real. That's going to be really hard if athletes who are the healthiest people are moved to the front of the line and the healthiest and the wealthiest right, are moved to the front to the front of the line. But on the other hand, it does, it, uh, on the other hand, perhaps, and I'd, I'd love to hear your view on this, perhaps it's worth it because if it's gonna convince a large percentage of the population who otherwise would not wanna be vaccinated, many of whom are at greatest risk because of socioeconomic realities, maybe it's worth it to put a couple of uh, famous basketball players or, or actors or singers ahead of everyone else for the for the common good, can you can you uh, comment on on your feelings on that? It's a typical dilemma, and when you deal with ethics, you many times have to balance between all kinds of argues because uh, arguments. Excuse me, because uh, it's it is a dilemma, and I can understand you know the the difference between a conflict and a dilemma is. A conflict, it's a win-lose game. A dilemma, and many times you can represent both sides, not acting, no, no, not ma making a show, but really both sides are inside of you and you can really represent uh, both sides and not only one side. But in the paper I wrote in Israel, I was against using celebrities in this point because of three reasons. The first one is that First of all, uh, before I encourage people that uh, don't have uh, any confidence or don't want to take the vaccine, I should give the, this vaccine to the people that are willing to get it and need it. I mean, elderly people and, and, all, uh, and uh, people that are in, uh, under uh, medical risk or whatever, because you can't start being responsible to the people that are not willing to take the vaccine and ignore or abandon the people that want to take. They, they should be the first ones. That, that's my first claim. The second claim is that a government from this point of view, and I know it's, it's, it may be very naive what I'm saying, but I really think that a government should try, if, to, if the government see it's their mission to convince people to take this vaccine, so they have to use doctors and scientifics. And the fact that a basketball player is willing to take a vaccine, I can understand it has a lot of influence and a lot of impact on the society, but you know, it's something wrong, something wrong because actually we are uh, educating ourselves to make those decisions, not according to scientific reasons or uh, logic reasons or intellectual reasons, we are trying to, uh, you know, to copy what players or singers or basketball players are doing. Something is wrong from this point of view of responsibility of the government to use a discourse that's, that is, is, has any, you know, connection to the real issue. So the fact third just, thing, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll say another one under The third, third thing is, at least in Israel, when you start with the basketball players, then it's also their family, their drivers, their coach, their other, you know, you, you don't stop there. And if it was one or two or, you know, five people that are really have, have a lot of impact, I, I would have do, done everything, anything. But we see that all the staff and the 
really every every uh, celebrity brought with himself another 20, 30, 40, 50. And actually this is also losing confidence of the society because the public is losing confidence that things are being done according to fairness, according to dignity, with dignity, with the right uh, uh, decisions. And actually it's who is, who is uh, you know, like we say in, in Yiddish, protectia, who is more close to the, to the plate or to the shot. It, and that's the price of it publicly is, is very high because it's also los losing confidence. So therefore I was in the bottom line against, even though I can understand that there are reasons why to do that. I wanna come back to the issue in a moment about public confidence, uh, but I want to ask you, if I understand correctly, your second objection to giving the vaccination to celebrities is that essentially to use uh, a rabbinic term, it's bad chinuch, meaning we're teaching and so even, if, even though it may help now, it's the, the ultimate long-term effects are bad if we teach people on medical issues to trust uh, celebrities rather than trust scientists. So Absolutely. even though it may help in the short term, in the long term, it could have a, a long-term negative effect. Is that, is that what you're mm -hmm. saying? Absolutely. Okay, that's really that's a really interesting uh, view. Thank you. So I want to go back to the question you mentioned about lack of public trust, because in the article you wrote about something that happened around Pesach time. Um, I learned a new slang, krovim uh, lahat which I had to ask my shlichim what that meant. They told me it's protexia. Um, so could you explain briefly what happened on Pesach and how you think that connects to the to the, let's say, to the diminishment or destruction of public trust in the system? Public trust is the most important thing for conducting or predicting a state. You cannot do things by law. You can, law is something that you can do, at least in Israel, maybe in the United States, the approach towards the law is more serious. But in Israel, and I think in an every democratic state, this is the most important thing, public trust, because when you lose your trust in the leadership and doesn't matter what kind of leadership, it can be governmental, it can be um, rabbinical uh, leadership, it can be every kind of leadership, then the uh, authorities cannot work. What happened in Israel on Leila Seder is, it was the first time that Israel were, you know, closed. And a lot of efforts were made by the government to pursue people not to go to the Seder, to their elderly parents and to stay alone. And, and I'm talking about my private uh, family. We have seven children, uh, every one of them with his uh, wife or uh, with our uh, daughter-in-laws or, or um, uh, son-in-laws were alone the first time. And I have a mother-in-law, 93 years old, that she was alone on Lila Seder. But the day after Lila Seder, everybody discovered that the president, that the prime minister, and other minister, the chief of staff, and all kinds of people uh, that they uh, announced that it's so important to protect ourselves and not to do, actually had the Seder with their family in their house. And the price of losing the confidence in the government, uh, that, that was the first uh, failure. Uh, and then it's like a snowball because you don't trust the government that the decisions, what companies or what uh, business can be open and what can be closed in, in this uh, period of time and who's, who's actually getting, the, who's making the profits of, uh, out of this situation and is actually we lost, and I'm saying when I'm saying we, I'm not talking a small, uh, a, a small uh, society. I think that the main thing that happened in Israel is losing the trust in the uh, government. Part of it is, as you know, that we are going to the fourth elections uh, in in a year and a, in a half. Israel is a very political uh, crisis uh, situation. So. All uh, this together means that the first lesson of leadership is 
קשוט עצמך, it's a Aramaic, uh, Aramaic uh, uh, phrase, קשוט עצמך, you should first of all demand and shape your uh, behavior and ואחר כך קשוט אחרים. You cannot do anything if you are not doing it first of all by yourself and you are the role model. And uh, I think conf- that's the most, uh, I think, this Lele Sebe had so much impact on losing confidence in the leadership that I think that part of the price that we are paying uh, today is a result of, of, the, of Pesach. That is a, a very uh, disturbing, <laughs> disturbing story uh, about, uh, about Pesach. Um, and it, it's incredible that it continues to Uh, affect people's trust in this you know life-saving therapy uh, that's available and people still uh, won't take it because of of their lack of trust of the government uh, I wanted to uh, touch base on uh, some other things uh, that you wrote this may uh, dovetail and relate to what you just mentioned I'll read an English translation um, about from the article that you wrote and Where you talk about the importance of transparency um, in terms of how the vaccine was developed, the trials it went through, and you said that transparency is very important because the importance of this stems from the fact that the hotbed for degeneration into the abyss is always a combination of very large sums of money, political interest, and public aspirations to solve the problem. And in the field of vaccines, there are indeed all three of these. So I've been wondering uh, about this as well, uh, wondering uh, about any type of uh, fraud that's going to start to develop around the, 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 the vaccine, people jumping the line, people paying off people uh, to, to get to the vaccine. Are you hearing any of this now? Uh, in Israel, what's your concern about this? What's your concern of the of the intersection between money and politics and people who want to get uh, the vaccine? what What are you hearing and 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 how how do you think the best way to deal uh, with with those issues uh, is? I'll say something first of all, in general. In general, every place that there is a lot of power or a lot of money, Or these kinds of, of it's an opportunity you can use it for good things but it's dangerous I think that the Torah says it when we read on Dvarim uh, about the king kingdom and the Torah is not against kingdom like most of the commentators said and we know from our history that we speak about King David and King Solomon and And other kings that were good good people that that made good things with their power but the Torah is uh, th- is um, realized that it's also very dangerous and because of that we see limitations lawyer Bell on machine you should not have a lot of women in those old days and not a lot of money and not a lot of horses horses is you Not only his motorcycles or cars or whatever, horses is also his tanks. Uh, he should limit his, uh, all his uh, abilities, the king, because in the Torah says, Levilti rum levavom echav. Because, you know, when he has all this power, he can see himself as the center and forget that he should serve the public. Now, what I'm learning from... There, and I quote it a lot, is the fact that we never ignore the danger of, of uh, a lot of money or a lot of power or a lot of everything that, everything that starts with a lot. And we're not against it, but we have to be very careful. Now, in, in the vaccine, as you translated what I wrote, there's a lot of money and a lot of things that you really want to to get it already and a lot of uh, everything that is connected to this so therefore uh, it's dangerous 
Now, because it's dangerous, you don't make decisions that you are against it, but you must open your eyes. And as you said, it should be transparency. Now in Israel, nobody knows exactly um, how many people will receive this vaccine. We know that there are approximately a third of the uh, population when the vaccine you know, started to get to the, to the newspapers and we could see the date, said that they are debating. But uh, part of, I can, you know, I feel that in the bottom line, in the end of the day, there will be only 5% that uh, will not uh, receive this vaccine because, uh, because it's good. I mean, people are still maybe waiting or saying it, I don't want to be the first ones, but there's no, I mean, I don't think it will have a lot of impact. Now, you can understand that the communication, newspapers and websites and whatever, uh, always will go to the extreme stories. So they'll find someone that uh, is against or something that happened uh, uh, because of the vaccine or whatever, but in the bottom line, this pandemic is, is dangerous and it has a lot of consequences also uh, on, on people that were ill and you know, came back and, and they're healthy now, but they still drag uh, all kinds of, of results of this uh, pandemic. So therefore I can, I think that in the bottom line, uh, more, every, every step that more information will be, will be said honestly to the public, uh, it will encourage more people and more people will get it. I, I want to say something about, about modesty. One of the things that people lose confidence is when they meet people that behave like big shots and are sh you know, positive sure in 100% that they are doing the right thing and are attacking everything that thinks uh, in the other way and they are ignoring the fact that there are uh, questions and suspicious and maybe there are dangerous things. And from what I learned from my experience as a rabbi and also in a, my ethical work is when you say the truth and when you say, that's what we know now this pandemic is dangerous, the vaccine is good, it may have problems, but when you balance between all the factors, the right thing is to get the, this vaccine as, as fast as, as uh, you can. And it's uh, decisions that you make also in a fog. You know, you don't make decisions only when it's noontime when the sh sun uh, uh, rises and, and shines everywhere. You, we all make a lot of decisions doing all over all over our life when the facts are not exactly clear and we don't know exactly what will happen, but we have to make decisions. And when you say that, and when you describe it, you know, in the right way, and I think it's part of modesty and part of being sensitive and part of really searching for the truth, I think that the impact will be much higher then to say, you know, this vaccine is good and nothing will happen, who knows? But we have to make this decision, hmm. these decisions. Right, thank you, thank you. So here's a question that uh, I hadn't thought of originally when we first uh, decided to do this talk, but now has, um, is al haperak as they say, and that is the question of the, the Palestinians. My understanding, and I'm, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that they are either on the bottom of the list or not even on the list right now in terms of getting the vaccination from Medinat Israel. Can you tell us what the reality is and what your thoughts about this are? Should the elderly Palestinians be next to the elderly Israelis in terms of when they get it? Should, should, they, should it be a parallel list? Should it, should it be different? What, what are your thoughts on this? I'll start with reality. Uh, the truth is, I don't know. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I really don't know what's happening. As far as I understood, the Palestinians don't want to get the vaccines from Israel 
for from political reasons. Therefore, they're buying the Russian uh, vaccine and they get it from Russia. So therefore, in reality, this is not the, you know, it's not an issue. And actually, I didn't see big conversations, a big conversation about it. Uh, so the truth, as I said, I, I don't know the reality. In principle, it will be very foolish from uh, the side of Israel not to try to help the Palestinians, even though they are enemies. But I'm not talking because of ethical reasons. I'm talking about, you know, um, balancing between the price and the profits. First of all, we live together. We live together. And if there'll uh, still be, if, if there'll be pandemic in the Palestinians uh, area and society, it, it will immediately affect uh, Israel. So it will be very foolish. But more than that, uh, this morning, I, I can, uh, as I don't know if you can see, we are living here. It's a new house that we just went in uh, here. And uh, people, uh, uh, Palestinians, uh, are working in the house near us. And this morning, there was a, a Palestinian here Palestinian, that brought his wife to, to work. And she sat outside. It was very cold outside. And suddenly she came in. And she knocked on the door, very bashful, covered, if she can use the toilet. And I said, sure. And, and then when she went out, I offered a cup, cup of uh, hot tea. Uh, to, she was very, very surprised that, you know, something is, is, is being done between us. She was sure that uh, I'm very dangerous, or at least I'm, I'm an enemy. And, you know, when you start in this way, we should use use every opportunity when we are talking about human being issues. I'm not talking, uh, I'm talking about humanity. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about settlements. I'm not talking about the conflict on the holy land. But when we are, when there is an opportunity to be humanity, we should uh, try to do everything that uh, is, is uh, trying to, to uh, use this opportunity in order to build bridges and not to not to break them. Now, from the ethical point of view, uh, as you know, we say kudmim. I also wrote about that. So, according to the Jewish halacha, you should you you should take care first of all uh, on your own, on your family, to and be responsible to your society. But when we say, I always emphasize that when we say that means that they are the first ones. But it doesn't say only and uh, uh, after and if the question, for instance, like I said before, is to keep reserves, big reserves to for Israel, or using that for the people that are under medical risk in the Palestinian territories. I think that the halacha will say the second thing. Using them, I mean, you are first, but not the only one. And and that is your general approach in terms of the other issue you raised in the article, which is about poor countries that don't have access to the vaccination. You're saying once once Israel vaccinates its population and I guess does want to keep some reserves, um, they should share their surplus with poorer nations. Uh, there was once one headline in one of the websites that Israel decided to do that. And I was very satisfied. I was very satisfied from this decision. Uh, I, 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 there's no follow up because uh, all the headlines now are politics. So therefore, I don't know exactly what I, I, I and most of the day I'm in my yeshiva, I learned Torah, I don't, I don't follow everything uh, always. So I don't know exactly, but it's not an issue. I think that Israel decided to, sh to, to at least part, small part of the vaccines that Israel have uh, to, to understand that there is a international uh, responsibility. Uh, we should not forget that it's the message that we uh, actually deliver to the world from the first chapter of the Torah that all of us were created in God's image. And, uh, and then we were separated. And then there are different nations and whatever. 
But the story of the creation that emphasized the fact that all of us and all human beings were created in God's image must have an impact and must influence also our decisions. It's not only a declaration, it's not only a story, it's something that has to be uh, interpreted and then uh, to uh, apply it and, and uh, 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 to have uh, uh, to emphasize it uh, and use it as a uh, as a um, way of living according to the Torah because otherwise it's kind of uh, hypocrisy. You say that everyone was uh, created in God's image, but actually you don't uh, do anything out of it. So you you don't uh, because of that. So right. so it's it's something wrong. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so beautiful to hear you say that that the, the, this idea that we're created in God's image needs to be a guiding principle for us as Jews. I always think um, you know of the song you know via hafta I try to tell you it's not just a song. <laughs> right, it's, not, it's yeah, a mitzvah. That's right. It's not just the song. Mm -hmm. We have to the, these these principles, which we often think are nice and sweet. They are mitzvot or guiding principles, which are uh, meta meta principles of of our whole of our whole existence. Um, okay, so I have uh, one or two more questions, and then I want to open it up to uh, people to uh, ask questions uh, in the chat. In, in, in Israel, or just in general, uh, what is the role that religious leaders, that rabbis play in this whole, this whole issue of, of the vaccine and the public health crisis that is this, that is this pandemic? Uh, unfortunately, rabbis are not part of the decision makers in Israel. Uh, and actually they don't have really any influence as rabbis on the governmental policy. They have influence on their society. Can, can you explain uh, why they don't have interest? Are they, are they locked out by the society no, no, no. or are they just considered no. irrelevant? I think it's irrelevant because uh, I am saying again, unfortunately, we, uh, the, the rabbinical world made the decision that most of our efforts are uh, being dedicated to our communities or to, to the religious society. And when you ask, for instance, how many rabbis are even known in the secular people in Israel that you say, Harav Hazeh, and I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking about rabbis that are functioning only, only as rabbis, I don't think that you can mention even t maybe a dozen, only a dozen of rabbis, even though there are thousands of dozens in, in, in of rabbis, because as I said, most of the rabbinical world work in Israel, unfortunately, and it's, I think it's very sad, is inside, inside the religious communities. So therefore, the rabbis do have a lot of influence on their society, especially in the ultra-Orthodox, in the Haredi world, where the rabbis were part of the problem in the beginning of saying that you don't have to do anything against this uh, pandemic, it's not dangerous, nothing will happen. And now most of the rabbis are encouraging their people to get this vaccine. So therefore, uh, the, at least from the the, the, the main benefit that Israel as a society will get out of it is that the Haredi world will be uh, more protected and maybe less, uh, because today they are in a big danger. They are in the higher percentage of people that are sick there and uh, ill there. And uh, it had a lot of, caused a lot of hatred towards them. It's, it's a big issue. And it's also the rabbis are not part of the general uh, uh, decision, but they are part of helping or uh, making the situation better because they have a lot of influence on their uh, society. My dream and the reason that we am working in Zohar in the department of the ethics is that rabbis will have influence on the entire society in Israel and will bring uh, uh, 
Jewish values into, into the decisions and into the discussions. And I really believe that in the, we're trying to educate the next generation. And there are some rabbis that have a kind of a position in those issues. And uh, I hope that uh, more and more will understand that the rabbinical job is not only towards the religious community uh, or the observant co community, that our main issue is towards Klal Israel, And that's the most important thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, halavai. Um, so this is, I think this question on the big scale of things is far less important, but everybody is talking about it. At least I shouldn't say everyone. When I say everyone, I mean all, all the rabbis, all the American rabbis. So I hate to put you on the spot, Rav Shirlo. Are you going to say a bracha on Monday when you receive your vaccination? And if so, which one? No, I'm not going to make a bracha. I'm from this kind of, I'm, I'm a brisker, you know. Uh, from this point of view, I'm, I'm asking myself a halachic question, not, not because of any kind of ideology. Uh, and not because of anything that is related to this, but also I think that when I read the sources, I don't think that there is a place to make it for oh, I'm not against, I don't, I'm, not a, you know, I'm not in a battlefield. I don't think it's the most important thing, but I will say uh, one of the Tehillim, Mizmore Toda, I will say, uh, I really believe that it was a kind of a cooperation between uh, Pfizer company and you know and, and the people and scientific and human being and Hashem that actually we are facing or at least I hope we are making the world better and having a lot of siyata uh, dishmai a lot of help from God in order to uh, confront this uh, this uh, pandemic and I want to thank him I will not do it with a bracha because of halachic reasons. But from the emotional feelings, I do think that we should say something towards Hashem. And I will say, Mizmorle Toda. Okay, thank you. Um, so before I ask you if you have any final uh, comments or specific things you want to mention, uh, earlier on in your comments, you said that one of the unique aspects of this vaccination is that it was fast tracked. Uh, are there any other unique aspects? of uh, this vaccination uh, that have come into your thought process in terms of, of how to, to deal with this? Or is this like any other pandemic that's, uh, that's existed over the course of time? And the only difference is we had, like you said, with the help of smart people and Hashem, uh, ability to fast track the science. Okay, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure I understood exactly what are you looking for. So I'll say two things and you'll tell me if I'm, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm towards the target. Uh, from the medical point of view, uh, it is a, a, it's a big jump, this kind of vaccine. And as, as I said, I'm part of the committee of uh, approving the genetic engineering and cells the therapy in Israel. This is not genetic engineering yet, but it's a big jump uh, towards it. And it's a, it's a great idea, this uh, working with the RNA and uh, it may open a lot of, you know, the, the horizon and the future looks much better, uh, better from the medical point of view, not only towards this pandemic, but also towards all kinds of cancer uh, diseases and whatever it is. It's something, it's really, uh, it is something great. And uh, a lot of research is being done to other aspects of, of, uh, of um, not only pandemics, but as I said, cancer. And I really hope that something great will come out of it. Uh, like we always believe that when there's a tsara, when, when we are under, you know, in a very crucial uh, situation, many times, a lot of things are being built out of it. What I'm more curious and less, um, I, don't, I don't know anything is what will, let's say that this vaccination will be a big success and this pandemic will be over us and we'll forget it in, in one year. Let's say, I'm not sure it's, 
I'm not a doctor, but let's say, will the world come back to where it was before? So actually nothing really happened. Or will we be really, will something be different in our approach towards, for, for instance, I'll, I'll, it can be how to organize our life because in Israel, what uh, we discovered is that the government as a national um, conductor is a big failure, but the local communities and the mayors are the big heroes of this story. And, and really the mayors are the big success that's uh, confronting this pandemic. And will it be, will it have a lot of influence in, in the future that will communities will come, you know, will be more common, more uh, people will be, will organize them, their life, not only uh, uh, as individuals or citizens in the state, but the congregation and not only the religious congregation, the community will have a lot of, a lot, of, a lot more of responsibility and connection and relationship, maybe, who knows, uh, from the other, you know, this is only one example. Uh, for, uh, I'll take another example. We discovered the big uh, meaning and the price of being lonely. Uh, you know, when people are stuck in home, uh, lost their jobs, and uh, it's, uh, it has even medical, uh, uh, influence and uh, uh, indi indicators. And so will we decide after this pandemic that we should always think about the uh, widows and uh, uh, people that got divorced and the lone people, the elderly people, uh, or we'll go back you know, to our life. And all these questions, are th these are the questions that I'm thinking about them, nobody knows. And everybody wish that this pandemic, when, when it uh, will come over, will have good influence. I'm not sure that this will happen, but if yes, I want to be part of it and I want to uh, advance it and to, to, to power, to, to empower it, because I think that this, you know, such a, a historical event in the, in the world should not pass and we should not forget it. We should be different uh, after it, but I don't know how to do that. This is the famous approach of <laughs> Rabbi Soloveitchik, right? When something bad happens, we don't, we can't try to figure out why, we only have to figure out what next, right? Yeah. What do we, what, what, what do we to do learn? with it? What, yeah. yeah. I, by the what you said about the failure of the national government in Israel and the rise of the mayor was, a total surprise to me, because I think many of us in the States feel the opposite. Many of us feel that Israel nationally did great because it's small and there is no local government. So everything could be controlled from one seat, while in the States, every state has their own rules. And, and it was so unruly here uh, that many people are like, wow, Israel really on some level has their act together. Now to hear from an insider that that's not the case uh, was a uh, surprise, at least to me. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, yeah, that was a good, that you, you hit the bullseye in terms of answering the question. So thank you, yes. Um, okay. Um, before, um, it doesn't look like any of uh, the participants has specific questions. Is there anything else that you, think is important for us to know uh, yeah. in this regard. I want, I want to speak about the role of rabbis uh, in, the, in, the, in this pandemic. What is the role of the rabbis? And I'm not talking about the pandemic, uh, I'm talking about the, the vaccination. And uh, we have a Google group of rabbis from all kinds, hundreds. And, um, and it's, uh, and the conversation actually was what is the role of the rabbi? Because the rabbi is not a doctor, he's not a scientific, and it's not responsible to say and to announce everyone must have this uh, vac get this vaccination because it's sec completely secured. He doesn't know; it's not his job. 
From the other hand, saying, I don't know, everybody make his own decision. A rabbi can't uh, say such a, such a thing because immediately the questions will, will come and will follow. Okay, everybody will make his decision, but in our community, 70 or 80% got this vaccination and 20 or 30 not. What are we permitted to do in order to protect us as a majority? For instance, can we say the people that not get this vaccination will not be permitted to go into shul or uh, send their kids to the kindergarten or uh, be part of, uh, be invited to weddings or whatever. So actually rabbis uh, cannot, uh, I, I think that the, the role of rabbis should be in two uh, kinds, in two aspects or even three. The first aspect is, as I said before, teaching and learning together a lot of uh, issues in Torah that are dealing with making decisions when the facts are not clear. And there are a lot, a lot of them. What we call safek. Safek is, is part of halacha and the idea that you have to make decisions. If, in, if you don't know everything and you know all, don't know all the facts, and in most cases, you don't know all the facts and what will be, but it, you're not free from making these decisions. I think this is a very important uh, issue that the rabbi should teach and discuss together with the community because it, it reduces tension. You don't come with you know, being absolutely sure that 100% of it is, is good. You say, we know, according to what we know, we have to make the decision that the positive way of behaving is to get this vaccine. This is the first thing that rabbi should do. The second thing is, this is much com more complicated, try to draw the line between uh, not forcing people to get this vaccination and even I'm against sanction as punishment against them. I think it's not ethical and it's not halakhically, but from the other hand, the right of the majority to protect itself. And uh, as you know, we still don't know if this vaccination prevents from uh, passing the, the, the pandemic to someone else or only protecting yourself. But if we'll discover that this vaccination is also avoiding uh, the fact that you will make someone else or transfer, shifting or transferring this uh, uh, pandemic to someone else, then the rabbi should uh, try together with the community to draw the line because I really think that the majority have the right to protect uh, it, uh, itself. And this is a very ethical and halakhically, a halakhic question. Mm -hmm. The third thing is, uh, as I said before, I think that we as rabbis should think towards the future. And I think that one of, you know, many of our holidays are historical holidays, Pesach and Shavuot and Sukkot and Hanukkah and Purim and uh, fasting. Today, we, you know, tomorrow is uh, Asara Betavit. We are gonna fast because, uh, because of a historical event. We are, we, something historical happened in the last two, day, two years, or uh, last year, it's not even uh, two years, it's, it's uh, one year. And I think that it's our responsibility to try to use this opportunity to make this world better and more dedicated to our uh, uh, values. And, uh, and we, sh we should start thinking about the future, assuming that these vaccination will be a big uh, success. Yeah, that's like you said earlier, what, what are we going to become after all of this? And uh, that's a mm -hmm. really important role that, uh, that uh, religious leaders uh, sh should uh, need to play. And we start thinking about, about, mm -hmm. uh, about all of this. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, there's one comment uh, from one of our participants, Mike Ozer, who uh, says that he had something else to contribute in terms of the role of rabbis in this age. Uh, of the importance of public health. So Mike, do you want to share with us what you were thinking? Sure, thank you. And thank you, Rabbi. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I find it, very, first of all, kol uh, uh, for for being so compassionate and uh, in your remarks and uh, and showing great kindness. I I found it very interesting what you said about the the role of local communities and mayors um, and uh, how people listen. I uh, I am a pediatrician, so I feel uh, I do have a strong feeling about the role of a rabbi in such a public health issue as this uh, to, to promote uh, the ideas of social distancing and mask wearing and, and, and things like that. And I do think um, uh, in the role, that the role of the rabbi is nuanced as, as, you, as you say, but a very important one because people listen. And uh, unfortunately the, you know, things get politicized uh, over here um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure in Israel as well. But I'm reminded of, of the Talmudic <clears throat> story of, of um, everybody should carry two notes and put a note in each pocket. And when you feel yourself becoming overinflated, you take out the note in the pocket and it says, I am but dust and um, and dirt, or, or uh, and, and yeah, and you feel mm -hmm. deflated, and you reach in and you say, "The world was created for me," and I think the rabbis, in that sense, have a have a message. They have to, in a sense, treat everybody in an individual way, and uh, and and because uh, the job is is uh, building community, and of course. Communities, even the even a small one, thrives as they uh, as they you know the rabbi can add greatly in that sense. Do you have any further comment on this in the in in the aspect of this? You sort of answered it already, but but I I do think that things become so politicized, and and the rabbi has a, a nuanced approach. I've 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 had discussions with with uh, our local rabbis. Uh, I'm over here in San Antonio, uh, which is 200 miles from Houston. But um, I feel that uh, rabbis do have a role in public health. I mean, yes, the public health authorities can, can uh, uh, you know, might make a blanket statement, but I think that a lot of times it's uh, in the role of public health, now that we know so much, it is the important, uh, the importance of the rabbi in communicating that to each individual uh, person that they work with, even in a nuanced way, in a way, in sort of a kind way that you suggest you can't just order, but you have, uh, but it is a responsibility to uh, bring people along in a sense, in a, in a way that educates them at the same time. I agree, uh, complete, I completely agree. Uh, I'll say more more than that. There is a sentence in Tosfot on in Baba Kama that says that everyone must be more a threat of causing damage to someone else than to uh, hurt himself. And I think, uh, as you said, it's not only science and not only medical uh, facts. It's also a lot of values. And when your value is that, first of all, your existence is also a mission. It's not only something that you can make all the decisions because we got our life from Hashem and we are responsible to, uh, to keep them and to be careful. It's part of your religious approach. And from the other end, um, it's not the other end, and expanding it says that it's also a religious um, commitment not to cause damage to someone else. So therefore, if you want to be a machmir in halacha, you should keep this social distance and use masks and everything that we should do in order to keep this world and keep ourselves and, and, and do everything that we can do in order to protect ourselves and someone else, 
as a machmir in halacha, I think this is a very important role of the rabbi. Uh, I, the reason I didn't speak about it was because we tried to dedicate this chavruta uh, um, together uh, to the vaccines. But what you said is completely right when you talk in general, what is the role and the responsibility of the rabbi towards the entire pandemic issue? You know, uh, I also feel I, I was I was thinking back to when there was the controversy about the uh, MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, mm -hmm. and I had a conversation with uh, one of our local rabbis, who said uh, that it was mainly related to New York, uh, and um, and he said, well, I'd have a hard time. Uh, agreeing, you know, making a, uh, counseling somebody or telling somebody that they couldn't come to school because they weren't vaccinated. It, it's really, we, we have to promote the sanctity of school. Well, of course, I understand what he's saying, but at the same time, he has to be, uh, and this is a rabbi that believes in it, uh, vaccination, but I, but I also uh, uh, feel that he, uh, he need, you know, it was incumbent upon the rabbi in that in, in a situation like this to very much be uh, under uh, to very much, I think, promote the idea that your decision can affect the well-being of another child or another family in the school, and if that is an if that has an adverse situation. It's important for the rabbi to be able to. I, uh, oh, the, yeah, I think you're right, and we have a. Lot, I can tell you only thing as a rabbi that we have a lot of missions. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can't hear you. Thank rabbi, you. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for for joining, and thank you, especially uh, Rav Sherlo. Thank you so much uh, for joining. I know it's a little late uh, in Israel. Thank you for making the time for us and for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. It's really a great pleasure, and more importantly, a, a deep privilege for us uh, to learn with you and to learn from you. And we thank you again, and uh, we wish you. Uh, First of all, an easy fast, and uh, you're getting your first dose of the vaccine on Monday. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll hear the echoes of your Ms. Morla Toda. We'll make it across the, the ocean to us. We hope that it is uh, successful for you and your, and your wife and, uh, and everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get together uh, with next time, hopefully for, uh, for happier more upbeat, upbeat topics. But again, this is, even though the numbers are climbing, this is a positive time as we do have this vaccine now, we should need to keep that in mind. And again, be grateful for the great partnership between God and the doctors and the scientists that brought us to this, uh, to this time. So, and thank you everyone for joining and I wish everyone a wonderful day and uh, an easy fast and a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much.